And welcome to Understanding Photography with Kim Ayres, episode 142. Today we're going to be giving feedback on pictures submitted by Anne, Amajit, um, Robert, Sandra, and I have a question from April as well regarding different kinds of monochrome. So that's what we're going to be looking for. And so if you're here live, leave me a comment. Um, let me know you're here. Um, tell me what the weather's like. So yes, here we are live on YouTube, unless you happen to be watching the recording, in which case make sure you subscribe. Mind you, if you're watching live and you haven't done so, make sure you subscribe as well and hit the little notification bell so you know when new episodes are coming up. Um, also, uh, yeah, yeah, there, there's all sorts of, just to remind some of you as well, that there's all sorts of different social media here. You can follow me on from Instagram and Facebook uh, as well. I mean, Twitter, don't think I'm I really much beyond notifying people that this is here. I don't tend to use that one so much. But also if you want to contact me, my website, kimairs.co.uk. You can always email me, kim at kimairs.co.uk as well. So I see we've got a couple of people in already. So like I said, let's leave me a chat. Uh, leave me a message in the chat. Let me know you're here. Uh, Picture Station, I think it's Amajit actually, says, um, every weekend I'm waiting for this valuable session for us. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. April says, hello everyone from a gloomy Long Island, New York. Maggie says hello from a dull and cold in a day in Castle Douglas. And it is, it's true. Um, I was out for a walk earlier. And although it's about supposed to be about five degrees Celsius, I think it certainly feels it could easily be minus five. There's a cold dampness in the in the wind. Um, Meg says hello, everyone. Rosemary says good morning, yippee, it's snowing here. That's snowing in um that's uh, yeah. Washington State, USA, yeah, over in the Pacific coast. Wow, I don't think we've not really had proper snow here in this corner of Scotland, not not down at this level at any rate. Oh, Marilyn says good morning from a cold Colorado. Uh, Robert is here saying howdy all from Texas. Sandra says hi everyone from a sunny Birmingham. Um, Stacy says good morning everyone. It's very cold here with partial sun. We're lucky no snow. Had my birthday week. Happy birthday, Stacy. Hope you've been. Hope you have had a good one. Um, Right. Okay. So I'm. Oh, I'm getting this funny little circling buffering thing again. Hope you're not too interrupted by that. Um, I, I really don't quite know what's been happening with the connection the last few weeks. There doesn't seem to be a huge amount I can do about it either. However, I'll see what I can do. Um, so, yes. Okay. Where are we? Um, so yes, let's make a start. So yes, like I say, what we've got then. So this week, this week is all about feedback on four different photos and answering a question from April. So we'll work our way through. Um, th this corner of the internet is the place for you to send in your images. Uh, if you want feedback, let me know what your thoughts, what your problems are. Send me the image. Um, let me know what your sticking points are. And it can be anything to do with photography from the settings on your camera to uh, compositional techniques to what to do about lighting to, to how to improve the narrative the story um, all these different things there's so many different aspects of photography and we all get tripped up by them somewhere along the line so it's really it can be really useful to get direct feedback on your images so that's what I'm doing here in this little corner of the internet so what I'm going to start with is I think we will start with Anne so Anne in Texas so Anne sent in this photo here and said I took this photo at the Louis Vuitton foundation in Paris in July in editing I flipped it and cleaned up the dark spots on the structure however I am struggling with editing the lighting and shadows for impact as well as the color tone any lighting or color suggestions to give the image more impact thank you Okay, well, I can see what, what you've got here. Yes, it, it's wonderful lines, lines and shadows and shape and form. Um, but it has to be said, the color really isn't doing a great deal for you. And I can see what you mean about the color, because what we've really got is what is sort of you would expect to kind of be a white wall. It isn't quite white. It's a sort of creamy beige with a sort of slightly gray bit in the lower part. And then the, the wood is is brown but not deep rich browns almost um and then there's a bit of kind of a gray sky behind the skylight windows as well so in a lot of ways the color i feel isn't really doing a great deal for this there's a lot to do with the shape not a lot to do with the color now with some colors 
uh, you can you can go in and you can kind of boost the whole color, boost the saturation, change the warmth of it. You could blue shift it, make it a little bit cooler, yellow shift it, make it a little bit warmer. But all these things would be playing around the edges and I don't know that they would actually make that much of a dramatic difference. What I would say, what immediately leaps to my mind here is the notion of black and white, really, because what this is about is this is about line and contrast. And it's the contrasts which are, and the, and, and the lines which are really the interesting part of this. So if I, let's open this in Photoshop. And so we take this, and let me just change the workspace over to here so you can see what's going on. So although Anne did send me the original raw file, which I must, I have to say, if you are sending me the images, if you send me your edited version, fine. It's very, very useful if you send me an unedited version because it gives me an idea whether there's other options we could do. Now, at this point, Anne has already decided on the crop she wants and she's flipped the image as well from the original raw file. And the, what, the bit I'm advising here doesn't really have much to do with any other bit of editing. I mean, whether I would crop it slightly different or not, I don't think is, is really the major point here. What I think is the major point really is that notion of black and white and contrast. And what I'm going to do, let's make sure I've actually got black and white over here. So if I want to black and white this again, we've always got the options. We can go to the black and white mixer or we can go to, um, we can just desaturate it. We always often find with desaturation, you tends to be fairly dull. Uh, maybe slightly more interesting is when you do the gradient map and the gradient map swaps between the light and the dark or uh, the, the, the color palettes over here, the front and rear color bits on the left. Now that and then there's a couple of different versions of this. There's the linear version, the classic version. Let's just sit with classic for the moment. And what we can see is we go from that to that. And I think that starts to make it a bit more interesting. Let's go to brightness and contrast and let's play around with it because part of the problem with the original color here is, like I say, it's an off white. It's not really a kind of white white. So, but if when you go to black and white, we can now play with the contrast. I can up that brightness a bit and make that look a little bit whiter. But then I can also take the contrast or actually bring that down a bit even. Push up the contrast and maybe actually bring that brightness down and allow those darks to be darker. Or another option here is to take the curves. And if I take, um, where's the curves gone? There, curves, yes. So what we could do here is we can darken that. If I grab that bit, it just darkens the blacks. We can even boost the whites a little bit, something like that. And I think almost the more you do, the kind of more, slightly more interesting it becomes. Um, and I think at this point, you're really kind of, I mean, you can, you can get really quite, you know, strong, but I think have still having some of the texture in there helps, but do you see what I mean here? And that basically, I think once you start moving into this direction, I think it becomes a lot more interesting. Finally, if you want a little bit more control over that, if we, I'll play briefly in camera raw where you can play not just with shadows, but blacks and whites. So again, we would desaturate here, but then maybe what we would do is play with the contrast. You know, so take that desaturation right down, play with the contrast, bring, uh, bring the shadows down and bring the blacks down, something like that. You could even boost the highlights a little bit, take the whites up a little bit, and then play with that contrast a little bit more, something like that. If you want, you can then grab the clarity tool and that then it seems to sort of accentuate a little bit more some of these sort of stripes that are coming through in between the large ones, which adds quite a nice bit of texture to it as well. And I think then playing around with that um, is giving us a different kind of feel. So that's your original picture. This is where I think it was really going. This is what I, what I feel and is is kind of giving you the shape now just to make sure that we're not ending up too dark always worth i mean it's bit, i seem to have been talking a lot about this recently so i suppose it's much more on my mind grab the levels tool and just check that you know i see that that just if i just nudge that up there's a little gap right over in the far corner i'll just nudge that up a little touch just to bring that lightness up it's only very subtle um but 
it's worth just bringing up to make sure that um, you are using the full range from the darks through to the lights. Uh, so I hope that gives you some thoughts there. And um, it's, it's a fun photo, it's a good photo, it's a strong photo but with all these lines, but I think ultimately it's that kind of thing. If the color isn't doing it for you and if there isn't an obvious way to improve the color, I always think, try it in black and white and then try it in black and white with a bit more contrast and see it because really the whole point of that photo I think is the idea of the strong contrast we're into kind of abstract territory really that's the fun of a photo like this we're not latching on to oh isn't that interesting timber frame they've got or I like the panelling they've got or look at the beautiful colour of the sky behind. If that had been a bright blue sky maybe that might have given us a slight difference but the fact that it was a grey sky wasn't really giving us anything. We've got the beautiful sunshine coming through into the shadows and I think that help, that makes really the difference. So I hope that gives you some ideas there Anne, uh, but thank you very much for sending that one in. So let me close that and now I've got a whole bunch more comments here. So lots of people wishing um, Stacey a happy birthday. Um, April says, creative idea. Rosemary says, interesting abstract, Anne. I can see what caught your eye with that structure. And Anne says, thank you, Rosemary. Sandra says, plenty of potential in this photo with lines and shadows. Uh, Anne says, that really makes the shadows the story, which is what caught my attention. Yeah. Um, April says, looks so much better with the black and white and the contrast editing. Love the shadows, nice abstract. Um, Sandra also says the, the processing raw really gives this photo the wow factor. I think sometimes you go, fact, yeah, you've slightly more kind of subtle sliders to play with in raw quite often. Uh, Rosemary says the black and white conversion does re really does emphasize the lines and angles. Nice. Meg says I really like the different lines in the photo. Marilyn says looks great. And Anne says thanks. Excellent. Oh, well, a successful one then, I think. Excellent. Right. Okay. Let's move on then. And what we're going to move on now to is Amajit. So Amajit sent in this photo. This is the edited photo. Um, although, uh, where are we? This is the raw, this is his, well not raw photo, it was taken on a phone. This is the original photo. And what he's done is he's cropped in a little bit and played, added, added, added some little filters, slight color shift or gray shift. Um, I am wondering here, Amajit, if this is your original as opposed to this one, does this mean you took it with a black and white filter on? If you took it on a black and white setting, then you're in, uh, it's just a point that you are immediately up against the problem that you can't make any more adjustments to black and white. One of the things um, that we've talked about is that there's several different ways you can convert to black and white. And that can have a dramatic change in that what shows up light, what shows up dark, and it gives you a wider range to play with. You have more options. So I would always recommend to take the photo in color, and then if you want a black and white version of it, look at your black and white options in the editing, and you will find that you have more options. Whereas if you take the, the photo with a black and white setting to begin with, you are, you are restricting the number of options available to you in the editing. So that little lesson aside, um, let's also, uh, let's see what Amajit is actually asking for. He says, it would be helpful if you could give feedback on this photo. This picture is clicked on a low quality mobile camera. That's the reason behind the quality issue. So my question is about the picture quality. Um, what really matters in the uh, picture and what we can do to improve low quality images. Well, this is a kind of tricky one. Like I say, first of all, if you take your photo in color, you have more black and white options. But there is a problem here that when we, so we've got the photo and at a web size, okay, let's look at even your edited version, you've cropped in a little bit. As it appears on, on a screen, and certainly if you happen to be watching, looking at this on a tablet or a phone screen, then it's kind of okay, it's sort of there. The, the biggest problem we have, I think, is the fact that the background is is very busy. There's a lot of texture. There's a lot of texture in this person. And the um, the texture, I think part, part of what you've done here, sorry, wrong one. Um, from here to here, you've, uh, part of your editing process as well as cropping in, I think what you've done is you've sharpened it. But what's happened is it's ended up sharpening the whole picture rather than selectively sharpening um, your man in the foreground. So 
if I go here, what we notice is some bits are fairly sharp. The, the back of this boy, the hair on the head of the back of this boy, it, that's where it looks like it's focused. Even some of the skulls hanging around his neck are quite in focus, but his face is slightly soft. And that gives the feeling that probably he was moving at the point that you, you went click. So I think it's probably he might have just tilted his head forward at that moment. So the face is slightly softer and in less, um, less sharp. But there is a basic problem that if you don't have enough information in the original photo, there are limits to how far you can go. Just like if you don't have color information in it to begin with, there's limits to what you can do with the black and white conversion. Also, if your photo is fairly low resolution to begin with, there's limits to how far you can sharpen up the image. So what I would say is if we take um, this one and open it in Photoshop, what can we do? So first of all, let's just crop in a bit. You've decided that what you wanted to do was mostly crop out you, that, that you're making the story about the man here. You're not really wanting it to be about the people that are with him. So you've cropped in closer and that's fine. That's a, that's a good um, decision, I think, to make in terms of your crop. But we do have the fact that this background is very, very busy. Um, it might have been a good idea if you'd had a, um, if it had been a slightly blurrier background. Again, if there was a color contrast, that, that would work as well. Um, but what we're really wanting to try and do is draw more attention to him. So one of the things you can do, certainly I think a vignette would kind of draw a little bit more. Uh, so if we go to camera raw here and um, a vignette, so that's just kind of darkening down the corners the edges, something like that. That's drawing a little bit more attention into him. So that's the starting point. We also have the problem though that this face is slightly blurred. Now what I would suggest here, if I duplicate that layer, is we want to try and lighten but also create a bit more contrast. So again, depending on the, the program you're using, I find with camera. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to be actually before I ignore everything else let me show you what happens if I do this and I come into here well, let's move back a bit so you can see some of the background if I take say this texture and I pull up the texture it's not just changing the texture for his face it's changing the texture for the background the background is already very busy likewise if I go to detail and I go to sharpening I can sharpen up his face but it sharpens up the background as well so when I sharpen actually when we go in, it's creating a lot of sort of weird, strange artifacts and everything else, which isn't really helping. So what we kind of need to do, I'm, I'm going to concentrate on the face here. I'm going to up the exposure, bring the shadows up a little bit so we can see a little bit more of his face. Take the highlights down a bit, then I can play with the texture. And the texture is now going to create a little bit more contrast and clarity even. Now the clarity is giving us more, more definition, more definition between the lights and the darks. Because when something is out of focus, it blurs. So what we're trying to do is create a kind of stronger contrast in the detail. So the clarity and that's, that's helping a little bit as well. If I go to the detail, if I could sharpen, I'm still not convinced by the sharpen. I think that's just kind of making it a bit too noisy. In fact, actually what I might even do is do noise reduction smooth that a little bit but they come up and then increase the texture and clarity a little bit more that's going a little bit dark up those shadows a touch and now i think we've got a much more kind of interesting face the problem is is you can see that it's done it to every part of the photo so what i would do then depending on the editing software you've got is i would mask this off so in this case i hold down my alt key and i click here that creates the mask so we're just seeing the layer underneath now I go over to my paintbrush, I've, where I paint white will bring through the layer we've just adjusted, where it stays black will show the layer that's underneath. So now, put that up to 100%, I can paint in his face, and only his face, without worrying about all the background. Maybe, what I also want to do is, let's just add a little bit more texture into his beard, because his beard is quite interesting, just that maybe the front that little bit around the bottom part of his hat. If I wanted, I could add in selectively. I could maybe add that little bit more into the skulls that are hanging around here. I might want to add in a little bit more around the bracelets 
that are quite interesting. Little stripes on the arms. A little bit of that metal tubing there. Oh, his, his watch. Um, and So I can selectively decide where I'm going to bring in this extra level of sharpening. But I don't want the sharpness all over. I only want it on some end. So that when I go back to here, you can see that it's only going where we have wanted it to go. And that draws more attention to his face and takes away from the fact that perhaps there wasn't quite as much information and that he was looking slightly out of focus. It's still not fixed it completely, but it helps within the, within the limitations that you've got. The only other way to get more detail in is to really, if you're wanting to say blow this up to a large kind of poster size or you know just a larger photo, is I, I think you will probably need to go down one of these AI sharpen routes. So there are the, the different programs out there that have the artificial intelligence sharpen. But what is happening then is they tend to take that. They're essentially the algorithms are quite often taking little bits of other photos to insert and they're building the picture for you. It's like the AI art. It's interpreting what it thinks should be there and putting in new information that isn't actually already there. It's not. What we've just done here is use the information that's in the picture already and adjust it to make it stand out in the places we want it to stand out. What the AI Sharpen does is it puts new information in that wasn't there to begin with. And sometimes it does it very well, sometimes it sort of does things a bit strangely. But that's another option if you really want to get the sharpness, but you might end up actually slightly changing the face and not having what you thought was there. So within that, I mean, again, other options you can can do. I mean, you have to be slightly careful, but say we were to um, filter blur. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come up here to not oh, so actually cancel that. I'm not wanting to duplicate that layer. I'm wanting to select all, create a new layer and then blur this um, filter blur causing blur. And what I'm wanting to do is not blur him, I'm just wanting to slightly blur this background. So, because that background is just grabbing too much attention. So I don't need to do a lot with this, but maybe even if I bring it to something like that, and again, I mask, mask it off, only now I'm going to paint in the, with the black for the layer below where I want it sharpen. So now I, I, I make sure I paint in his face and his hat. Now it's going to be slightly around the edges, we're going to kind of miss it a little bit, so we've got to be slightly careful. Um, and you would need to take proper time, change your brush size, go to the edges, find selective bits. There's there's all sorts of things you can do once you're um, taking a bit of time with it. But I'm just doing this quickly, just to kind of give you a sense of what's going on. So and just pull that in there make sure he so now what we've done is we've got him he is sharp we've um, we've also blurred the background a little bit and you can see that that just takes that soft softens the edge because if we go back to your original photo one sec let's select all that copy paste that there remove these layers so we can see then the difference between your original photo and this and now what you can see is that from the original photo, we weren't able to see his face so clearly. The background was very busy. Now we've done this. We've softened the background. We've got much more attention drawn to his face. We've got the contrast. It feels sharper. And it feels sharper partly because in relationship to the fact that it's more blurred behind. So I hope that gives you some ideas, things to play around with. But certainly, Amajit, I would recommend always take your photos in colour so that you have more options to convert to black and white afterwards. So, but thank you very much for sending that in and I hope I've given you some useful ideas there. Uh, right, okay, so where are we? A um, couple of little comments here. Uh, Sandra says, a great subject. April says, an interesting portrait shot. Uh, Stacy says, the character in the photograph is interesting. John Harvey says, coming in late and a very interesting person to photograph. I'm glad you could make it, John. OK, let's uh, so just a wee reminder here that if you find these podcasts useful, interesting, entertaining and you would like to support them on some level, then buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is one of the ways you can do it. Also, don't forget to invite your friends along. I'm sure if you enjoy photography, you know other people who enjoy who enjoy photography who would also 
uh, benefit from these podcasts. So bring them along. Robert says that's an amazing difference from the original photo. Rosemary says it's interesting to uh, to it's interesting to me how the modern watch mismatches the traditional dress. And Amajit says thank you, sir. Uh, you're welcome. Right. Okay. Let's move on. So Sandra. So Sandra. Yes, Sandra from Birmingham says I was in the Birmingham Library. And where are we? So let's show. Uh, Let's show this one first. And so this is uh, Sandra's edited photo. She says, I was in Birmingham Library on a sunny day trying to get the shadows from the circles outside reflected inside the building. I didn't quite succeed with that. Now, presumably the sun's coming from the wrong direction for that one. Um, but I did manage to take a photo with a church in the distance being framed by a circle. So if we zoom in here, here we can see the church is framed by one of the circles. Um, I've, I photographed for the church and then lightened up the inside of the library in Photoshop. Also try to convert to black and white as well. Could you please have a look at the photos and let me know what you think. It's great to get somebody else's perspective. So this is Sandra's edited photo. This is Sandra's black and white version. And this is the original. So what you can see then is Sandra was inside Birmingham Library. Uh, she's noticed the spire, the church on the outside thinks that's interesting, especially the fact that she can place it in the circle. If she exposed for the inside of the library, then the outside would um, overexpose and you wouldn't really notice much out the window. However, uh, so what she's done, so she's exposed the camera for uh, the outside, but that's made the inside dark. But then in her editing process, she's then brought up the high, uh, brought up the detail out the shadows so we've got some of the stuff going on. She's also playing around with black and white to see what that looks like with the shadows. So what I would say with this, I can I absolutely get where you're coming from. So it's a great idea. I can imagine standing there in the library, you look out, you can see the wind, you can see the church out the window and you've made certain adjustments left and right to make sure that you get the church lined up and that's great. In terms of how that comes across in the photo, I would say part of the problem is is it's missed. I don't think it's obvious that that's what you're doing unless you already know the church is there. When I look at this photo, what the, the dominant things are really the, um, the, the pillar, the, the, the leading lines of the bookcases, the circular uh, window frame, echoes of that circle with the, the lights up here. But I don't really know that you necessarily notice the, the church itself. And one of the things we can do with this is I will just use an old trick I've talked about before, but it's well worth doing again. If you're ever not sure whether your picture's really drawing the eye to where you want it to, what we do, I'm going to duplicate this layer. I'm now going to filter, blur this to a point whereby it's beyond immediate recognition as to what it is, something like that. And then image, image rotation, um, flip vertical. Right. So when we look at this, what do we see? And the whole point of doing this is to take your eye away from um, seeing what you, you, to get you away from your brain telling you what you're seeing to what your eyes are actually seeing or what somebody else's eyes might be seeing who don't already have your preconceptions. And when you look at this, what we have is we have a lovely bright streak here we have a little bit of kind of an orange thing going on in the middle. There are shape, shapes and verticals and diagonals and some interesting shapes. It looks quite nicely abstract. But is there any sign of the church? No, none whatsoever. Because the church itself is too small. For you, looking at it, it was big because you could see it. And it's very much like when you look at the moon, we always think the moon is much bigger than it is. And yet you can block out the moon by the tip of your little finger held at arm's length. And I remember just being blown away by this. I couldn't believe that actually arm's length, tip of the little finger, you can block out the moon. And I'm thinking, no, surely not. The, 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 the moon's got to be bigger than that. And yet, sure enough, if you, the moon's out tonight, stick your finger up there, you can block it out. The brain sees the moon, the brain knows it's seeing the moon, it filters out all the space around it, and so seems to make it larger. In the same way, if you've got a tiny little chip out of your tooth and you run your, you run your tongue out of it, the, the tooth feels so much larger. The brain, 
it magnifies things. And because you knew the church was there, your brain is magnifying that church. If you don't know the church is there, the brain doesn't magnify the church. In fact, you may not see it. So let's go back to your, um, your picture and go, well, OK, if the, what would we want to do with this picture instead? So I'll tell you what, let's, let's uh, find your original. And um, so this is, this is your original here. Uh, now, so actually, somewhere along the line, we've got a little white line propped up at the bottom, so I'll just uh, chop that bit off so that's not getting in the way. And again, without the blur, the church is there, but we've got to really zoom in to find it. Now, if you are wanting this church to feature, what we partly have to do is go, at what point can we see it? When I look here, my eye is drawn to the predominantly to the shapes. I come in a bit, it's still the shapes. I come in a bit, it's still the shape. I come into here, and it's around about here, I start noticing the church out the window. So in a way, we kind of don't want to be zo uh, zoomed out much more than that. So if I was to take this now, bring this down a bit, what we're trying to do is crop in. Now, that's very cinematic. That's not going to be much there. So really if we do something along the region of the along the lines of this you may as well actually make these um so the bookcases come in and we are kind of going for symmetrical so there's a symmetrical sense with the with the bookcases and maybe a not quite a slightly off center with the church so when i do that and now we zoom in to fill in the screen now we at least we can kind of see the church but what we're really wanting to do is see this church in the circle. So another option here is, let's say we were to take the curves. And that's levels, wrong one. Go to curves. And let's say we were to darken. What we're really wanting to do is we're wanting to see the, the church out of the sky. But essentially, all the lightness of the sky up here is what is kind of pulling our attention away. So I'm going to darken this down a little bit like that. With the curves and then using the layer mask I'm going to use the black here and I'm going to paint it back in just this circle here now that in itself feels like too strong it, you, it just becomes noticeable that you've only done that so if I then take that down to something like 40% widen the brush soften it a little bit and just sort of gently kind of pull out a little bit like that you can kind of sort of um, just tuck that back in a little bit like that. So you are getting a bit more attention here, but you're just trying to sort of soften the edges of it, really. Um, and now what happens is the attention gets drawn specifically to that circle, which has the, uh, the picture. Now, if at this point, I'll copy that, I'll add all those together. I want to pull that into Camera Raw and then bring a little bit more detail out with the books. I can now pull the shadows up a little bit um, to just bring in some of those, those things. Maybe play with the clarity, something like that. Um, and let me just take those highlights down a fraction. Something like that. And so now we've got the books in, so we can see we can see that we're inside a library rather than it just being silhouetted shapes. But because we've got that kind of lighter patch, purely where the um, where the church is, our eye gets drawn there that little bit better. So I don't know, maybe we could do that again. I'm going to, if, what if I grab that curves layer and then repeat it? I can repeat it. Okay, so that's now really exaggerating, but a little bit too strong. But I'm going to take that and just drag that down, take it back up until there's a point whereby it's having an effect, but not looking like it's you're trying to get to the point whereby it's edited enough to have the effect without it looking massively edited. And at this point, again, on 40%, I could maybe just um, turn that to black and just bring some of these books back into play uh, just to make sure we've got got that. Maybe even, got to be careful about the floor because the floor will again draw, draw attention back. Maybe I can bring a little bit of the lights out as well. So I think really kind of there is more what if this is if that's the point of your photo. If the point of your photo is to make sure you've got the church in there. You want people to notice the church. Then what you've got to do is what do I need to do 
in order to emphasize that. You've already got the idea that you're placing the church within the circle. The part of the problem is, is that there's so much sky in the other circles and there's a kind of a busyness with the, 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 that red brick of the buildings around is also grabbing the attention over the church as well. I mean, there's bits here where you might want to go in and potentially lighten and darken that or even take down, let's just see what would happen if I go to here and I go to the reds and I start desaturating. I pull the color out of the reds. You see, take down those buildings there. Now that allows this to stand out slightly more. Perhaps what I might also do is a little bit of dodge and burn. So I take the dodge tool, lighten that up a little bit, take the burn tool, darken it down a little bit. So I'm just really creating a bit more contrast purely on that tower. And, um, and we've desaturated the red uh, of the, the buildings around and it does allow that to stand out a little bit more. But we do have a problem with the fact that in the end, that tower is up against a very busy background. But in terms of the rest of the building, I think having it in that circle, you just we've, what we've done here with that curves is we lightened just that circle and kind of softly darkened down everything else. And so if your intention then is to get people to notice the tower in the background, you need to be closer into it so that they can see the tower and then you need to subtly play with the lights and darks so that the eye gets drawn to the place where you want the eye to go. So I hope that makes sense. Hope that gives you uh, some thoughts and ideas about your editing processes there, Sandra. But thanks very much for sending that one in. Um, oh, Amarjeet says, can you rate this picture out of 10? No, I can't. <laughs> I'm not being facetious here, Amarjeet. Um, rate compared to what? You know, I you you the the a comparison. In order to rate something, you have to know what scale you are rating it on, compared and what you are comparing it to. If I was to take your picture and place it in with the top photographers of the world, it wouldn't appear anywhere. It would have a very low rating. If I was to take your photo and place it in with a whole bunch of amateurs who have never really used the p camera before it would score very highly. So nine out of 10 on one scale, two out of 10 on another scale, it's meaningless for me to give you a number if I don't know what the scale is, if I don't know what I'm comparing it to. Um, if you want to, the, and also, <laughs> it's like if you go online um, to the, the, sh the photo groups like um, Photo Crowd, Guru Shots, and you put them in for competitions. If you put that into a competition for um, um, colour landscapes, it would score very lowly. If you were to put in for um, people in black and white, it might score better. Um, if you were to put it in for people wearing necklaces or people with beards, it might score better than um, people taking their dog for a walk. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? That there, there are definitions that you, in order to rate an image, you have to be very clear about the parameters you set. So in order for me to give you a rating of something out of 10 makes no sense at all unless I know what parameters I'm supposed to be rating it against. So I'm not being funny about this. It's just, I think I, I think it's a really important point because I have the same photo. There's different competitions. I've put the same photo into different competitions. And in some of those photos, I've come in the top 10 of several thousand people in, entering. And the same photo has come in the bottom 10% of several thousand people entering. But it's been a different competition. So everybody has a slightly, so, it depends on the parameters of the competition and the uh, and what the judges are looking for when they rate it. So if you want to if you want to get a general sense of it, what I would say is go to these online sites like Photo Crowd and Guru Shots and Viewbug and put it into different contests and see what kind of reaction you're getting. And that will start to give you a sense of how well that image is being received. So I hope that I hope that helps make sense. Um, Right, where are we? We've also got, okay, Stacy says, uh, nice lines through the dark. April says, a neat looking library. I like when you um, brought up the lights so you can see the books. 
Uh, Sandra says, uh, thank you, Kim. Really interesting to see where the eye is being drawn and how to make sure the church gets more attention. I will watch again and see if I can replicate what you have shown me. Yeah, excellent. That is, of course, I mean, well worth remembering is the fact that all these are recorded. Um, so you can go to YouTube forward slash Kim Ayers and there are 141 previous episodes and in an hour or so there will be this one too. So um, there's a massive um, resource here that you can go and tap back into skip through, find bits of editing, bits that are useful for you, and yes, try and replicate them. You can pause the video, you can you can play these videos back at half speed or at double speed, depending on how you want, to, and have them on if you can split your screen or you have two screens. Uh, so lots of things to try out. Yeah, don't forget there is a, a, a resource now of nearly three years worth of um, podcasts to tap into. Uh, Rosemary says, Sandra, it's definitely worth going back and reshooting because the idea is great. Cool. Excellent. OK, so let's move on then. So next one I'm going to talk about is April. Now, April didn't send in a photo. April sent in a question. And April says, hi, Kim, please show a photo of yours that has a monochrome color such as Arctic, Mercury, etc. I want to understand what kind of um, what kind of photo these colors are made for. How can a color like Rouge or Zeke benefit a photo? I understand the concept of black and white and old fashioned, but I need more understanding of the others to a degree, uh, to, to, to a degree that is amazing to the viewer. Thank you. OK, so what we're talking about here is the fact that there's black and white. We know black and white. But you quite often come across black and white with a tint, with another colour. Now, I don't personally have anything called Arctic or Mercury or Rouge or Zeke, so I don't actually know what these colours are. But kind of like the colours of um, toilet rolls or um, wallpaper colour or you know paint colours there are all these things and probably chances are on Instagram or other uh, photo filters they will have these kind of things there and when you click on them they create different moods and feelings. So when might you use them? Now this is a kind of tricky one like I say we're, there's a again when you might use them kind of depends a little bit. If you're using these kind of like photo crowd type competitions, but generally speaking, when you say monochrome, you kind of want to stick with black and white. If you go too far into the sepia, the blue, the green, the orange, or any other thing, what tends to happen is viewers tend to be quite conservative and unadventurous, and, more, and you'll get less votes for something that is highly colored than you will for something that is, uh, you know, or rather a, a strong monochrome of a different color other than sort of the black white gray but let's talk let's show you what we're talking about so i will uh just close close that one of sandra's let's flip you back over and what i'm going to do is i'm going to drag a picture of a tulip in so this is a color photo and we want to make it black and white and what i've talked before about is that there's a number of different ways we can turn it to black and white so one of the things we can do is what we did earlier, we did the gradient map. And this makes this really quite dark. Oh, there's another option here where I go to classic. And this brings up, the, but the purple in this is quite dark. We've got the yellow is more or less this yellow and red over here and bits of green. If I wanted, I could go to the black and white filter. This has made this fractionally lighter and I can charge. I can lighten up that red in the back or I can darken it down. I can boost the yellows. Um, play dark and the greens, um, the magenta, that's where the, the tulip itself, the, the front tulip tends to be. So I might, if I want to make it lighter, I can do that. So we can play around with that. Or for that matter, we can come here and we can go to the channels. So we've got the red channel, the blue channel, the green channel. Each of these gives a different style of black and white. But we can go beyond that. We can create other kinds of colors. Now then there's a notion of color grading. Right now, sometimes what we can do is so if I go to um, let's say I go to uh, color lookup in this and this has a whole bunch of color grading. So now so if I click something like tension green, what it does is it gives it a whole kind of weird kind of green shift and it's taking some colors and playing the teal orange plus contrast actually turns the purple into a blue. Uh, soft warming look night from day, moonlight, late sunset. Now, then they have some things like this one is Kodak 5218. Uh, so this is emulating um, the, a particular kind of Kodak film stock. 
because back in the days of analog when you would take a photo particularly color photos is depending on the kind of film stock it did some of these things would have slightly faded they would boost some colors but maybe not cope quite so well with other colors or they might not go into the full range of blacks and so if you want a sort of slightly kind of um, dated look you can sometimes play around with these so this has a whole bunch of different color so I can you can see I can just kind of scroll through here and it's adding a whole bunch of different color options to it and that's kind of fun but you can also do that with black and white so say I take let's just straightforwardly go to a hue saturation desaturate that and then let's go back to the color lookup and let's start with the tension green and you see now it's on a black and white everything with the tension green is giving it a green this teal orange plus it hasn't got other colors to latch on to so it gives you a very dark teal um, this one ends up with sort of slightly purplish or lilac and you can end up now this one isn't some monochrome it's more duotone what you've got is you've got a movement between orange and purple this then is a kind of again a slightly sepia but there isn't a deep black in it and so you can kind of change your style of this is going to be a very kind of cyan level to it um, so you can change your color shift here just by playing around with some of these options as well. Um, another option, actually, with a, if I go to the hue saturation option up here, let's just go back to put that back to normal. That actually has a couple of custom ones where I can go to um, sepia and that automatically changes it to, to a sepia tone. And they have cyanotype as well, which is a very blue monotone. So that's another way of getting direct blue tone. Um, another option, okay, let's let's say we take an actual uh, black and white, black and white photo, or one that's already been edited for black and white. So we'll take this one, um, this fun photo here. Now, I've already played with the black and white, taken the colors, and I've given it a particular kind of look that I want, um, which has slightly kind of, um, what's 1930s, 40s, um, horror movie kind of vibe to it in a way with a tilted camera sort of strong shadows um, so but there's things that we can do with this and one of the things you can do if I go to the let's go back to this gradient map now the gradient map itself has created um, in a way isn't really that that's just darkening it but what if I decide to choose a different color now if supposing I decide to go for red um, what do we do? Ah, I know what I'm doing. Let's click on here. That's what I'm trying to do. So red and white. I'm gonna now that's creating a wah! That now that feels very different. I don't really like that. So what if I actually decided to do um so let's go back here, let's change that to red. Uh oh actually do it the other way. So instead of red to white, let's have red to black. And so now if I go to the gradient map and click on here. Uh, hold on a sec, might need to start again. I'll just delete that gradient map and set a fresh one. There, that's quicker. So now what we've got, you can see, is it's really kind of moved. Now it's almost like you're looking at it through a film of, um, you know, like a, 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 a red plastic sheet. And it gives a very, very different feel to it. Now, so we can play, we, we can play it that way. Or what we can do, another option here, if we want to play around with colors is to go to the hue saturation this is already in black and white and i click there's a little button here down here that says colorize and if i click color it fills the color now this is it takes the saturation down by 25 percent and now i can move run along so it's starting off here with a kind of reddish moves into a sepia shifts into greens slide it along we start to move into cyans and blues and then indigos and purples magentas and then takes us over to the red end again. And in the red end, actually, if I want to take the saturation and boost this up, we can see that this makes it much more red. And again, if I slide back down, now because we've boosted the saturation, the purples are stronger, the blues are stronger, all the colors are stronger like that. So when might you use this? Well, perhaps it kind of depends on the, well, like all of these things, it depends on your audience. It depends where you're putting it. Something like this with all these red tones on it, maybe if you're making a movie poster, 
but you're trying to sort of have more of a kind of a, you might go for the reds if you're going for a more that kind of horror movie, or you might go for the greens or bluey greens if you're going for a kind of futuristic cyberpunk type uh, film. You might go for sepia if you're trying to make it look like um, an older uh last century photo first part of the last century with sepia or victorian times even always has that kind of uh, feel to it so what you have here is the option to play with these are all monotone they move between one color or you or between white and black really with just one color shift in them um, or between red and black or between blue and black and if you're making a poster this is this this might work better if you're, like I say, trying to put it into something like a photo crowd type competition or a guru shots type competition where people are, are doing high speed judgments, you very often find that just like a sunset will trump a portrait just because pe more people like sunsets than they like pictures of people. Um, there are certain kind of themes. People, there, there's a, a conservativism, small c, with, with a lot of people's tastes. Uh, if you're if you're aiming at photographers, people who are uh, who do much more with their photography, amateur you know amateurs who've been doing it for a long time, people in camera clubs or yeah, just enthusiastic amateurs or professionals, you tend to find that people get fed up with seeing the same thing and they prefer to see something a little bit different. But if you're show if you're showing to something which is mostly amateurs, people who are just doing quick photos on their phones and never really giving it a lot of thought, they kind of tend to like something that they recognise the look of, and if you move too far away from that it wouldn't do well so something like this with this kind of red tint might actually do better amongst more slightly more professional or serious amateur photographers but I can guarantee now something like this would score very very low if your viewers were uh, primarily you know just in, um, beginners complete beginners so I uh, don't know whether that helps I hope it does it kind of gives you that idea of um, so it's really about the audience you want combined with what it makes you feel. If you kind if you kind if you by shifting something slightly blue or slightly green, it makes you go, ooh, then that's great. That's great. But, it is, um, but there's always that contrast between what you like and what the people you're showing it to might like. If it if the photo is for you, then do it the way you want. If you're trying to score slightly higher in, you know, move up the rankings in these um uh, online competitions then you might have to tone it down be slightly more conservative with 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 your edits uh, but hope that hope that helps there april uh, right okay what do we say what have we got here um rosemary says great question april thanks for asking um oh april says my microsoft laptop has it okay so your laptop has automatic little um options to go for that's fair enough um Robert says, reminds me of Smith's album cover. <laughs> April says, yes, I see some of them similar to my computer filters. Now that's neat with your portrait photo. Thanks for the feedback. So depending on your audience, what the experts are looking for. Yeah. OK, cool. Excellent. Right. Glad that works. So we're going to move on to final picture now of uh, this afternoon. And that's a Robert. So Robert says, Anne and I were in, um, we were in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago and were able to do some night photography. I found this scene at Pennsylvania, 1700 Pennsylvania Avenue. So let's find Robert's scene. Here we go. Um, which is right next to the White House. You can see the old executive building to the left. The steam coming out of the manhole cover caught my attention and I tried to compose a good shot while dodging cars. Yes, yeah, standing in the middle of the road is never a good idea, I think. The White House police thought it was funny as well. I'm not certain that what I'm capturing looks uh, I'm not certain that I'm capturing the look correctly. I like the lines on the street and don't think the cropping in uh, more would tell a better story, but it's always uh, great to get your take on my shots. OK, cool. So I can absolutely see what grabbed your attention here. We've got these strong yellow lines. We've got a backlit smoke. So there's all steam, the steam coming out of the manhole covers. It does look really quite. I have to say it's one of those things I've seen in the movies. I've seen in the movies in Washington and New York. You see steam coming out of the manhole covers. Never seen it in the UK. I just, you know, it's, a, it's an entirely American phenomenon uh, that I've seen it in the movie. So quite fun to see a photo of it. Uh, 
the first I will I do have to say here, Robert, the first thing that strikes me is I just want to straighten that hurrah. It doesn't feel quite straight. It feels like it's tilted to the left slightly. <laughs> uh that's my starting point with this. Um, let's, I'll tell you what, let, now Robert has sent me in the original, so let's just open up the original and um, see what we've got here. And so we can see you've already done, now there's a bit of, quite a bit of noise here. If I look up here, ISO 2000, F2. Now this really strikes me as strange, Robert. Perhaps you can answer me this. I noticed this before. You've got an F2 and yet F2, and yet it appears to be pretty much sharp all the way through, which really confuses me, because generally speaking, an F2 will tend to be a very wide aperture, will create quite a narrow depth of focus. And I would have thought if you were focusing on the steam, then everything else would have got a bit more out of focus. Now, I can understand you've probably gone quite wide with this, you, but it's a 28 mil on a full frame camera, will mitigate some of that, but it still seems like there's a lot more depth of focus than I would have imagined with an F2. Maybe it's the particular lens you're using. However, that aside, that's just me going off on a tangent wondering the, the what if. But what we can do immediately, what I would do with this, is just go into the detail, take that sharpening down a bit, take the noise reduction up a bit, get rid of some of that noise. Um, that makes me feel slightly better. If I was to then go to the basic and hit auto, that lightens everything up into a level that I don't really like. But what I, for the moment, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag the highlights down a bit um, bring the shadows up a little bit so I've got something that I know that I'm playing with that I can edit afterwards. So I'm going to click open with that. Once that's opened, I'll just go and close these so that I'm not getting in the way. So now we've got this picture. So first thing we're going to do is crop it. But the thing is, like I say, actually, these, I would just want to tilt it just a fraction. And I think probably what we're looking really here is to get the verticals of these central buildings. Because, because you've got it on slightly wide, it's tilting out slightly to the left, it's tilting out slightly to the right. So you've got to make sure that your central verticals are a bit more there. Then we can pull it in. I quite like the way that what you did here was you made sure that this diagonal is coming down into the corner. You did that was a good that was a good point. Now I noticed what you've then done, you also cropped out those lights because you felt they were detracting, but I think you kept in that little bit of flag. So we'll do that. We'll go with something like this we might need to kind of pull that out a little bit here maybe pull that out a little bit there just a bit so we'll take that as a crop which is fairly close to yours now what am i going to do with this what can you do with this now you played with the clarity a bit brought out a little bit more detail to be honest part of what i think here you you're getting that because you're getting the steam coming up because of the cold is my understanding and if, if this is um you're up in Pennsylvania in the middle of February, it's going to be cold. It doesn't overly look cold. So getting your colour balance, I think, is one of these things here. But, but we also don't want to you lose that lovely bit of yellow there on the street. So here I'm kind of tempted to sort of play around a little bit. So let's say what I'm going to do. I'll just du I'll duplicate that layer and let's go to Camera Raw and I'm going to give it a blue shift. Just a, not, not massively, but just kind of take it something like that and you can see now what I'm looking at here is I'm looking at the steam I'm ignoring everything else I'm looking at the steam and I'm giving it that sort of slightly blue shift into there and that immediately makes everything feel a bit cooler having done that we've then lost some of that lovely bit of yellow there so I'm going to mask it and um, go back to here and um, bring that back on 100 and paint that back in now, the other thing we've got, I understand that you like this here, but it's there's a lot of foreground where there's not a lot happening. I really kind of want to darken down this foreground a bit. But at the same time, we don't want to lose that lovely yellow. So what I'm also going to do, I think, if I just select all copy paste, so we've all got that on a new layer just to show you what's going on. If I do, I'm going to um, select color range. And I'm going to just select the yellow. And we, we can see here. Now, if I select the white, you can see all the light colors. You can see this little box here, what's getting selected. If I select the black, all that lot's getting selected. But I just want to select the yellow here. Now I've got that selected. What I can then do is I can create um, an inverse mask so that it's, it's going to select everything that's not that. So I hold my uh, finger down on the Alt key, and now 
the yellow below is going to stay as it was. Um, in fact, actually, let's, let's do that again. What I'm going to do, right, hold on, voila. Let me come back here. That wasn't really what, it's curves. What I want to do is I want to dark everything down here. But now, it selected this, but this selected the wrong bit. So I don't want to, I'm going to invert the mask. And actually, the quickest way to do that is Control and I. This is where I'm at. Now what's going to happen is as I pull that down, you see, I can pull that right down, and we still keep the yellow. Now, obviously, I don't want to do that all the way, but I I'm not, forget the rest of the picture. Just concentrate on the road. I want to darken that road, but without this. So now I can come back in with the mask and paint back in the rest of this bit, but leave the road dark, darker, but leave those yellow lines strong so that we're not worrying too much about a lighter road. So do you see what I mean? We're just managing to darken the road, but we managed to keep the yellow there. And in fact, what I might even do, if I go down to a layer below here, this part of me wants to even maybe boost the yellow a little bit more. Uh, so if I, what do I do here? So again, well, okay, let's just select, a new, select all that onto a new layer. And again, um, filter, camera raw filter. I just want to boost that yellow a little bit. So maybe slide that temperature a bit over here to make sure the yellows are coming in. Um, and again, mask it off and just gently um, paint that back in so we get a stronger sense of yellow there. So then once we've got all that, I think you can also then go in and play with uh, the other aspects of which where we want to get a bit more texture into these things. So maybe at that point we're grabbing the clarity tool and we're sliding that and that's giving then that lovely boost to the texture in the buildings and the smoke uh, playing around with that. And so you've got something along this line. Now, you can play around with a little bit more subtlety. I seem to have boosted up a little bit more of the road than I wanted here. So again, I might just um, mask some of that off a little bit here, some of these little bits on the road so that it's not grabbing such attention. I might even do a bit of a vignette or even take out some of the bits there but I think overall then what this is kind of what you're talking about Robert this is an option at any rate so we're making sure we're, we're making a feature of the yellow of the lines and these lovely shapes but we're also trying to make sure that the road itself isn't so bright that it's overpowering everything else so if we can get that road to be darker but still allow the, those lovely yellow lines then these yellow lines then act as leading lines that draw us up to the, to the steam um, and then we can play around with the, the contrast, and we've got all these lovely bits of texture of light and everything else that's going on. So if you're wanting to keep those yellow lines in, that's kind of the way I would suggest it. Otherwise, you can kind of crop in something like this. If you're trying to make more of the more of the steam, you then maybe just make more of the steam. Don't worry too much about getting this little bit in, and kind of crop in here. In fact, let's tell you what. Let's just kind of do this. So. This is where our attention is going, and we we could even get a little bit simpler. We want enough of the buildings here to know that it's in the town. Maybe a crop like this actually draws slightly more attention to the steam. Um, but this is it, it's kind of depending on what you want. I certainly the way you crop that before, I think you'd um, you're liking this line. It's a fun line. You're wanting to keep that in, but you're just wanting to make sure that you're not it's only the, the yellow lines that are creating it. You're not wanting to get the rest of the road being too light and taking your attention away because you do, in the end, want to have your eyes drawn to where the steam is coming out of the manhole. So I hope that makes sense, Robert. Um, uh, but a wonderful uh, picture. Thank you very much for sending that one in. Uh, right, what, have we, what else have we got here? Um, April says, great documentary photo. Robert says, it's Dutch tilt. <laughs> uh, it might be a phrase I've not heard before. Um, Sandra says, interesting photo. Robert says, Canon 24 to 70, great lens. I think Canon is making great glass. Uh, Rosemary says, Kim, your voice in my head saying straighten determines my very first step in editing these days. <laughs> it makes such a difference. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think 
make sure your horizon straight or if not the horizon make sure your your vertical if depending on the thing you you know you might need to anchor it to a, a vertical more than a horizontal depending on the kind of photo you're using uh rosemary also says i really like this image robert is fascinating subject highlighting it beautifully and you survived the daring location of the middle of the street <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought there was something else I'd seen on America movies. Isn't there a, a law against jaywalking? Is that the phrase? There, here you, you can't be convicted for just crossing the road um, or standing in the middle of the road. You might annoy a few people, but um, I don't think you can be convicted of it. But I thought there was something a bit dodgy in American laws about standing in the middle of the road. However, um, if you weren't being arrested by the White House police or they were just laughing, I, I guess you know what you're up to um right okay meg says really lovely photo robert says thanks for the feedback i will give the edits a shot excellent okay well that draws us to a close thank you very much to Anne, amajit robert and sandra for sending in the, uh, the pictures thank you too to april for an uh, interesting question as well so Hopefully you found that useful. As we already mentioned, 142 or 141 other episodes, you can always go back and mine for information. Unless you have a brilliantly photographic memory and you can remember the past three years worth of stuff, you're certainly doing better than me if you can. Um, next week, then, we will be doing more of these. If you would like getting feedback on your photos or you have specific questions like April's, Ask me, um, get the photos in and get them in as early as you can. It certainly made it easier for me this week that both Sandra and Anne had their photos in pretty much by, or in fact, I think Sandra was in even on Sunday before, shortly after we finished the last podcast and got hers in on Monday. This made my life an awful lot easier. Uh, it gives me time to kind of look through the photos, start working out what kind of feedback I can give effectively. It also means that if more than four or five people send something in um, first come first served to a certain extent you've got more chance of getting uh, feedback on your image if you get it in early so please do of course if nobody sends me anything we're going to end up with a very short podcast as well so make the most of the fact that this is your place to get feedback on your images and let me know you send your images you can either put them in a facebook group understanding photography with kim Ayers, or email me kim at kimairs.co.uk and if you find these podcasts useful interesting or entertaining then do consider supporting them with buymeacoffee.com forward slash kim airs can never have too many coffees <laughs> um oh last couple of comments here um rosemary says uh, thanks for excellent lesson um April says, yes, but everyone does it anyhow. I guess this is the jaywalking. All states are different. Robert says, it was too cold for the police to charge me with jaywalking. <laughs> and right, everybody's saying kind of uh, have a good week. Right. That's brilliant. Thank you so much to everyone. Um, and uh, take care. Uh, see you all next week. Cheerio. Bye bye. Uh, oh, find the right kind of. That's the one I want to do. <laughs> bye bye.